Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. As we gather together here this morning on this Sunday, November the 15th, 2020. Just one announcement as we begin. Of course, we are looking forward to the celebration of Thanksgiving in just a few weeks. And as a part of that, our church will once again be working with our partner congregations at Bethany Evangelical Lutheran Church and also the Castle Shannon Presbyterian Church as we attempt to provide a holiday meal for those who are in need. Yes, things will be different this year. We will have different procedures in place in, uh, in recognition of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we will be offering takeout and delivered meals on Thanksgiving Day. So if you would like to be a part of this, I would hope that you would consult our church website for more information. I would also hope that you would contact our church secretary and she can put you in touch with the leadership for this particular event. We will need volunteers. We will need donation of funds. We will need donation of turkeys and people to bake and to carve turkeys at home and bring the carved meat into the church. So there are certain things that we will need, and I hope that you will take the opportunity to provide these in the midst of these troubled times. You know, our, our coordinating group that has been coordinating this effort between Bethany, our church, and the Castle Shannon Presbyterian Church, they looked long and hard at the challenges that we face in our world today. And they decided that it would certainly be possible for us to make all of the safety precautions necessary so that this food can be prepared for takeout and for delivery. We're not having any in-person seating at all this year, but we felt that we could at least do this much because the needs in our society are great during this time and those who are hungry certainly need to be fed. So I would encourage you to look for the story on our website that gives all of the further information concerning what we will be doing at Thanksgiving, and then once Thanksgiving is passed, look ahead to Christmas as well, as we will be uh, doing something special at Christmas also to help those who are in need. It is wonderful to be with you in worship on this day, Please hear these words from the book of Psalms 95, verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker.
In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength I saw this cornerstone This solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When tears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we give you thanks and praise for this day as we enter into this month of thanksgiving. You've challenged us through the words of the prophet Micah to worship you and to give you praise as we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Enable us during these days to do exactly that, to do justice as we work for others, to love mercy as we seek to give of ourselves for the needs of others, and to walk humbly with you as we follow all of the spiritual disciplines that you've given to us. Enable us to be grateful during this month not only through our words, but also through our actions, as we seek to behave towards others 
in the same loving fashion as Christ himself has behaved toward us. Bless those who are in need today. Bless the sick and those who mourn. Comfort each one of us as we spend these moments in your presence. For this we ask in the name of Christ our Lord, and as he has taught us to pray, so now let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken generation when all is dark, you help us see There is only one salvation We believe, we believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ He conquered death We believe in the resurrection And he's coming back again We believe So let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing and temptations we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion
Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. It will be my privilege to share these words of the Lord with you, after which I will share with you my message for today, which is entitled, Talent Search. I've taken that message title from the fact that the scripture that I'm about to read to you is the very famous parable of Jesus, the parable of the talents. Our Lord is speaking. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in these few moments, having heard your word from the mouth of Christ himself, speak to us your living word for today with instructions for our living, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Today we bring to a conclusion our sermon series for this month of November entitled The Micah Challenge. We've been focusing upon those immortal words in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, where God calls upon God's people through the words of the prophet to do three things, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Those three things we are challenged to do once again here this morning. In general, to do justice means to live in a way that generates a strong community where human beings can flourish. 
Those words to us come from a special book that a group in our church has been studying, the book Generous Justice by the author Timothy Keller. And Tim Keller, as he talks about doing justice and what that means, he says that essentially it means that each of us are called to live our lives in such a way that generates a strong community where human beings can flourish. An essential part of doing justice is when those in the majority take it upon themselves to disadvantage themselves in some way so that those who are in the minority can receive what they need. In the task of doing justice, Tim Keller says, Christ is our ultimate example. For the one who knew no sin became sin for our sake. Christ disadvantaged himself by coming down upon the cross and gave himself for all of us. In like manner, you and I are called to give of ourselves for others. And when we do so, we experience the richness of a great Hebrew word, that word being the word shalom. When the majority does justice by disadvantaging themselves, then the majority experiences shalom. The whole world, according to Keller, experiences shalom. That great word, sometimes it is very simply translated as peace, but the word shalom means so much more than peace. Shalom means reconciliation. It means a state of fullest flourishing in the world in every dimension, physical, emotional, social, and spiritual. It means a world where we can celebrate the fact that relationships are right, perfect, and filled with joy. When we follow the example of Christ, by humbling ourselves, when we follow the example of Christ by doing justice as we disadvantage ourselves for the sake of others, then this atmosphere of shalom comes upon the world. Several years ago now, a book was written by Nora Ellen Groach. Uh, Nora Groach is a professor at Yale University and her book is entitled, Everyone Here Spoke Sign Language. Nora Groach in the early 1980s was involved in studying a very unique population that once lived on the island of Martha's Vineyard off of the eastern seaboard of the United States. In the 19th and early 20th century, there was an interesting phenomenon there on Martha's Vineyard where there was a very large population of persons who had been born deaf. Groach says in her book that part of the reason was because uh, these folks had, had, could trace their ancestry back to the uh, community of Kent, England, to a, very pop to a very unique population of persons there in Kent, England, who were known for generations for having a high incidence of deafness among those who were born in the community. So for generations, there seemed to be this hereditary deafness that was very much a part of the community there on Martha's Vineyard, particularly, as I say, back in the 19th century and the early 20th century when it was a very isolated population there on that island there on Martha's Vineyard. And in the early 1980s, Professor Groach interviewed some of the people who were still alive. They were quite elderly at the time. The last person ever to be born on Martha's Vineyard with this hereditary deafness was, uh, was 
born in the 1950s. So all of these persons by the early 80s had reached a, a station in life where they were getting on in years. And so before the entire population passed away, uh, she felt that it was important to document some of their experience. And she interviewed some of the people who lived upon the island at that time. And she was told, you know, we didn't think anything of it. One person said to her, you know, everyone on the island spoke sign language because everyone knew that there was this issue. We had deaf residents, we had neighbors and friends, and even some of our own family members who could not hear. And so, and so the individual said, everybody on the island spoke sign language. It was just something that we all did. And so whether it was a town meeting or whether it was out on the street, all of us spoke in sign language. We did that for the sake of those in need. In Groch's book, you can hear about what a blessing it can be when we do justice by disadvantaging ourselves. The whole island learned sign language so that everyone could be included and no one would be excluded. This is the atmosphere of shalom that is God's intention for the world when all of us, even the majority, is willing to disadvantage itself for the sake of the minority to make sure that, that everyone has the possibility to flourish to their fullest potential through their physical, emotional, social, and spiritual being. This is what God calls us to do through the Micah Challenge, to do justice in this way. Today we come to the parable of the talents, this very famous parable of Jesus, where Jesus tells this parable about the man who was getting ready to go on a journey. Now we should make note of the fact that actually this is, the first, this is the second of three stories or three parables that exist in Matthew chapter 25. You can think of them as a, as a trio of teachings of Jesus. Jesus begins this chapter in verses 1 through 13 by telling the parable of the bridesmaids. You know, the parable of the bridesmaids when they're waiting for the bridegroom to come and, and they're trying to make sure they all have their lamps trimmed and ready, but, but the bridegroom comes unexpectedly, and some of the bridesmaids are caught unawares. And before the, uh, the parable is done, some of the brides, bridesmaids indeed are not ready, and the bridegroom passes them by, and as that parable comes to a conclusion, we hear that some of them go off where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth because they weren't ready, they weren't prepared when the bridegroom arrived. Then we come to this parable of the talents, where we have this story about a, a rich uh, landowner who was going away on a trip and he divided his property among some of his servants for safekeeping while he was away. And to one servant he gives five talents, to another he gives two talents, and to another he gives one talent. And he tells them to manage that property faithfully until his return. When he comes home, he calls them in to give account. And the first two of the, of the servants have been quite industrious in his absence. The one who had five talents has made five more and is able to offer ten talents to his master. The one who had two talents has made two more and is able to offer four talents to his master. But the one who was given just the one talent, his life and his heart were filled with fear. And he was afraid that he didn't have very much. He only had one talent, and he was afraid to lose that one. So he took that one and he hid it in the ground, and so in the end he offered that back. And you hear in this parable that the owner is not happy. Not happy with that last servant. He says to him, you could have at least taken that one talent and given it to the bankers. That way when I returned, at least I would have had what was mine plus some interest. And he says, as for this worthless slave, 
throw them into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable tells us that the Lord has given us something. We each have talents to invest. Now, of course, talent was a monetary unit back then. When you and I think of, of talent today, you and I think of talents and abilities which we have, and I think either way of thinking about it, we ought to think about it in both terms. God has given us money, financial resources to invest. God has given us other resources to invest. God has given to us time, talents, and abilities to invest. The point of the parable is that God has given us all something to invest. All of us. How many times do we think much like that third servant? How many times do we think to ourselves, oh, I don't have much. I've only got this one measly talent. So many other people have so much more than me. I've only got this one measly talent. How many times are we like that third servant and we think to ourselves, I just better preserve what I have. I shouldn't try to use it. I shouldn't try to grow it because I might lose it. I think there are lots of times when we think this way. I think that's part of the reason why Jesus told this parable. To get us, each one, to realize that God has given us something to invest. That's part of the purpose of this whole series. Challenging us all to invest in God's work of the kingdom. Invest your time. Invest your talent. Don't hide your candle under a bushel to use another one of Jesus' stories, but instead let it shine forth so that the entire house can receive its light. Don't hide what God has given you. Even though the times are scary and can sometimes be hard, don't hesitate to give to your church. Don't hesitate to pull out that pledge card and to fill it out and to make an offering out of what God has given to you. Don't hesitate to make an investment, you see. Make an investment so that God's Word can be shared with others. The Lord's given us something to invest. Another thing this parable says is that, is that our client the master of the vineyard, who of course is God, our client expects a healthy return. We're expected to invest and to do something profitable with what we've been given. And ultimately, both the initial investment and the return, both these things belong to our master. Both of these things belong to God. This is an incredible challenge that the Lord extends to us in this passage here in the gospel. So Matthew 25 begins with the parable of the bridesmaids where we're warned to be ready because we never know when the bridegroom might return. Then in this second parable, this parable of the talents, we're told how we are to be ready. We are to have invested what God has given to us and provided a return for the kingdom in preparation for the master's return. And then there's a third segment here in Matthew 25. It's the story of the sheep and the goats. It's a story about judgment. After this passage that I read to you this morning, we read in Matthew 25, verse 31, that it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All of the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at the left. 
Then the king will say to those at the right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was a I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Matthew 25 says. Lord, when was it that I saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that I saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that I saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. See, this chapter is powerful. Matthew 25, is powerful. It begins with a warning to be ready. Then it begins with a statement of fact that we each are given talents and God is searching today for talents to be used and invested in God's kingdom. And then it tells us the importance of it because there are people who are in need And when that time of judgment, that final time of judgment comes, the thing that will determine the separation of the sheep from the goats will be how we have reached out and served those who are in need. For every time we do that, we minister to Christ himself. My friends, Jesus is the example for our giving. He who was high became low for our sakes so that we might receive the overwhelming resources of God's love. You and I are called to give in similar fashion. And so I close out this series simply by saying, do justice. Live your life in such a way that you will help to generate a strong community where human beings can flourish, where the poor can be lifted up and the oppressed can be lifted up and the imprisoned can be released. Live your life in such a way where human beings can flourish. Do justice even if it means disadvantaging yourself, do it so that others might receive the advantage and be helped, just as we all have been helped. Truly I tell you, Jesus says as he brings this chapter to a conclusion, just as you did it to one of the least of these members of my family, you did it to me. Let us pray. O Lord, enable us to offer the talents that we have. Banish all fear that might cause us to do as the third servant had done, to hoard and keep to ourselves what really should be invested in your kingdom. For this we ask in your name. Amen. I believe you're the Son of God. I give my all. 
I thank you for the manner in which you continue to give in support of the Lord's work through the Mount Lebanon United Methodist Church. Once again, I would encourage you, in addition to your offerings that you continue to send through the mail and online and in other ways, I would encourage you to take this opportunity to make your pledge of support to our church's ministry in the coming year of 2021. You know, these are difficult days and difficult times. We don't have great crowds of people coming to worship in person, and so therefore we can't receive our pledges in frankly the way that we usually do. We're depending upon you. Uh, if you've been in church in person, then you've received one of the pledge cards. I would encourage you to fill it out. If you've not been able to worship in person, then go online through our website. You can find a copy of the pledge card that you can print out and fill in and send it in through the mail, or there's even an online pledge card that you can access through the giving tab of our website. However you choose to do it, I pray God's blessing to be upon the world as we extend ourselves to those in need. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, bless these gifts, those gifts that are intended for immediate use, for serving the needs of others, and also bless these pledges as they will be used in the coming year to address needs that we may not even be able to envision right now. Use them. Multiply their use and effectiveness throughout our world so that those who are in need will be restored to life and to wholeness. In Jesus' name, amen. of our God is clear. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Find the talents that God has given to you and make an investment, an eternal investment in God's kingdom. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.